As we celebrate Palm Sunday, we're looking back to one of the most important seasons that the Jewish people celebrate every year, and that's called the time of Passover. Now, as we get into the Palm Sunday story this morning, I want to give you a little context of what Jerusalem was like at Passover time. Usually Jerusalem housed uh, or was home to roughly 100,000 people, but on Passover week, um, our, what, what the archaeologists and the historians tell us is that the population would multiply by about 40. So can anyone do 100,000 times 40 right now? How many? Four million people. Imagine a small town going from 100,000 to four million people in a week's time. Every house is filled. Every inn is filled. There's not a couch. Well, I don't know if they had couches there. There's not a place to sit or a place to lay that is not filled with somebody that you may or may not even know. And those who could not fit in Jerusalem because there was just not enough space would set up tents and they would make residence around Israel. And so for this particular week, you had a ginormous, if that's a word, a ginormous um, group of people. Now, this particular gathering was a tradition that started for the Jewish people roughly 1,400 years before. And if you know some of the biblical story, you might remember that there's a story in the book of Exodus. And the Jewish people at that time, the Israelites, uh, or Abraham's descendants, however you want to say it, were in captivity to Egypt, and they were forced to, to do hard labor in the fields. They were forced to uh, do hard labor in construction. They'd make bricks, and it got really bad. The slave masters would beat them, and they were miserable. But the Israelites cried out to God. And the scriptures say that God heard their cry, and God delivered them through means of all these miracles. Now, there were a handful of miracles, a lot of miracles that happened And Pharaoh still would not let God's people go. But you might remember there was a final miracle, a miracle above all miracles that finally caused Pharaoh to let God's people go. And it went something like this. God made a declaration to the Israelites and actually to all the people. He said, listen, in just a little while, in a couple nights, I am going to pass through all of Egypt. And when I pass through all of Egypt, I will strike down the firstborn of every family, of your livestock, of any living creature. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) You know, it's it's this tie that I'm wearing today. (laughs) It's like so tight. Man, you know, I got to tell you, I... (laughs) I wore this tie in honor of Kirk Larson, who always, and Dennis Larson, because I thought if, if maybe I could wear a tie. Oh, I can't even get the button undone. I'm like, it was hilarious. I, well, I'm do, do I need a man to come help me? Thanks, Seth. I love you too. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Um, I decided I would dress up a little bit, you know, but I wasn't going to wear a tie on Easter. That's why I wore it this week. Anyways, um, where was I? Uh, where was I? The Passover. That's right. The final miracle, thank you. Uh, God said, I'm going to pass through and I'm going to strike down the firstborn of all the living creatures. But he did say this, whoever trusts what I tell them and to trust God was basically, he said, slaughter a lamb without defect and then take that sacrifice and blood and put it over the doorposts of your home. And then when I pass through to strike down the firstborn, I will pass over all the households that have trusted me to put the blood of the lamb over their doorposts. And as God gave the command, he did, exactly what he, would, he did exactly what he said he would do. And he passed through. And the devastation to the Egyptians were, why are you grinning at me, Seth? Does my tie look ridiculous now? <laughs> so that's good. You're just, you have this smile on your face. Okay. Um, so, so, God, so God basically uh, struck down, as he said, all the firstborn. And this devastated Pharaoh. And finally, Pharaoh let God's people go. But when the Egyptians, the Israelites came out of Egypt, God also said to the Israelites, listen, I don't want you to ever forget what I have done for you here in Egypt. I want you to tell this story to your kids and the grandkids. And then I want you to have a celebration every year called the Passover for a week. And you are going to basically reenact the Passover and remember the delivery 
that I granted you on that day. Now, the thing you need to understand about the Passover celebration at the time of Jesus is that it became so much more than remembering what God had done back then. Because right now in history, the Jewish people have been under oppression for a long time. Currently, Rome, uh, Babylonians, as soon as other folks uh, before them, and when they look at the Passover, they're not just saying, God, thanks for delivering us then. They're saying, God, you've done it before, and now will you do it again? So Passover celebration is remembrance, and it's also a prayer and crying out to God that he would deliver them. So they would come for a week, they would worship, and they would celebrate, and they would take out not their Bibles, but they would take out their scrolls and they would listen and they would pour through the scriptures to remember the promises of God. Because as they looked back in this book, they found a God who said, you know what? You're right. I did save you at one time, but God said, I will save you again. And I will send a Messiah who will rescue you. And so they've come this week to say, God, would this be the week that you send your Messiah? Now, Here's the thing. If you gather four million people in a city who are sick of being oppressed, who believe that a Messiah will come on the way, what do you have going on in this city? You have a really big potential problem, don't you? I was reading one author. He said it's, Jerusalem was kind of like this. Jerusalem was like a, a powder keg waiting to explode, right? Just a spark, just the right thought. And all of a sudden, the people are going to seek to be freed. And they're going to be crying for revolution, and they're going to be crying for freedom. All it would take is a spark. Now, the Roman Empire knew this. And each year, as they got ready for the Passover, the, the, Roman, em- the Roman Empire would actually send a group of Roman soldiers in a parade into Jerusalem from the west side of the city. Uh, A lot of soldiers, big strong horses, with one mission. Keep the peace of Jerusalem. Make sure if there's a spark, you put out that spark. Because we don't want any problems here in Jerusalem. That was their order. Now, of course, you can imagine that's not an easy order. Because a lot of different things could spark a revolution, right? Now, on one hand... Let's say if, if a Messiah shows up, they might want to kill the Messiah and take him out. But what's the problem if you kill the Messiah? You have the potential of everyone else revolting, don't you? And so it's a very sensitive time with the power of Rome and Passover. And then here comes Jesus. You know, Jesus every year would actually go to the Passover feast. He was a good Jewish man. He went with his parents first. We saw it in Scripture. And then as he had disciples, he would visit with his disciples. But this Passover feast was the one that would change everything. And so I imagine, I don't know how he said it to his disciples, but I imagine it was something like, hey boys, it's time to go. We're going to go make a statement and we're going to go into Jerusalem. And that day was on Palm Sunday. So what I'd like to do is pick up the story there. And I would like to read to you um, from the story of Palm Sunday Justin Marty, best tech guy in the world. Do you have my PowerPoint thing? Is it awkward when everybody's watching you walk it up to me? (laughs) Can we just thank God for Justin because of all the work he does here? All right. Thank you, Justin. Here we go. Mark chapter 11. By the way, this story is told in, uh, in actually all the gospel stories. This is just one version. So this is the book of Mark chapter 11. It says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. That's just funny to me. Is that funny to you? Jesus tells his disciples to steal a colt. If anyone asks, just say, Jesus needs it? I don't know. 
I wouldn't try that if you like to steal stuff. All right, here we go. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed, so we have a parade going on, shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now, maybe you've heard this story a thousand times. And what I'd like to do, uh, excuse me, what I would like to do for you this morning, though, is I want us to try to step into the shoes of a Jew who has seen this unfold before their eyes. Because what you just read was a very intentional moment that's dripped, is dripping with all sorts of meaning. So I'm going to walk through the main elements of the story, and we're going to see what it means, and then we'll talk about what it means for us. So here we go. When Jesus came to Passover, he was one of the people who did not stay in the city. He and his disciples actually stayed in a place called Bethany. And when Jesus was coming to Jerusalem from Bethany, there's actually two roads that go into Jerusalem. There's one that has more of a, a northern route, one that has a more of a southern route, and Bethany is east of Jerusalem. Usually, most travel, travelers would take the southern route. It was less hilly. It was easier to get to Jerusalem. But on this particular day, Jesus said, no, we're not going to take the easy route. We're going to take the northern route. It's a little bit longer, and this is what special was about the, this is what was special about the northern route. The northern route actually went up to the very peak of the Mount of Olives. And so Jesus would make his entry into Jerusalem from the top of the Mount of Olives. Now here's the question. Why in the world would Jesus do this? It's a very significant spot, that mount for the Jewish people. Let me show you a scripture, a prophecy from 500 years before. Zechariah 14, 4 said, on that day, the Messiah, his feet, will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split into two from the east to the west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half of it moving south. You see, the Jewish people believe that when the Messiah came in his power, he would actually descend from the top of the Mount of Olives. And what the Jewish people believed is that when he came down the Mount of Olives— he would travel into the city, and he would go into the temple. And this is the crazy part. When the Messiah would go into the temple, they believed this is the moment that all of their dead ancestors would rise. And all of Abraham's children would be resurrected from the dead, and they would follow Jesus to the temple. And then they would have an army so they could go and battle the people who oppressed them. See, this is what they were waiting for. And Jesus was enacting this before them. Now, what's really interesting, it, it still actually holds true today that the Jews believe that when the Messiah comes, the dead will be resurrected. Here is a picture, just I love this picture, of the Mount of Olives today. And you can see the Mount of Olives is filled with graves of those who are waiting to be resurrected when Jesus, when the Messiah, comes into Jerusalem. I shared this fact a couple of years ago because I think it's really great. But the average spot today is, is, a, is a little more than $30,000 if you want to get buried on the Mount of Olives. And if you want a really good spot on the Mount of Olives, it'll cost you $50,000. So get them while you can, because they predict they will only be there for 10 more years and there'll be no more room after that, which I'm surprised there's actually still room today. But here's another interesting fact, this is just for fun, is that everyone is buried with their feet facing the Temple Mount. And that's true in all of Jerusalem. The idea is, <laughs> this is what one of the websites said, I, I swear, is that that way when you were resurrected, you'd be facing the temple and you wouldn't be confused. And all you had to do was walk straight forward to the temple. <laughs> it's crazy, huh? And I, and I guess if I was, you know, if that's what's going to happen, you know, I don't want to walk a long way, so I try to be as close to the temple as I could to. So Jesus knows this place means a lot to the Jewish people. And he knows the prophecy in Scripture. So when he chooses to come into Jerusalem, he comes from the east, from the Mount of Olives. But he does another thing, and you caught this in the text. 
is that he doesn't come walking. He comes in the Messiah ride. What is the Messiah ride? The donkey, right? I mean, if, if the Messiah came today, what do you think he'd ride? Honda Civic? <laughs> Mercedes golf cart? I don't know. But Jesus came on a donkey because they didn't have a Honda Civic back in the day. Now, once again, this is, you know, this is not by accident, but this was also a prophecy in the book of Zechariah as well, to which uh, he prophesies, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea. It was not an accident that Jesus asked his disciples to take a donkey for him. Now, I don't know if you caught this. This is Palm Sunday, and the text I read you is made up of only 11 scripture verses. Do you know how many of those verses are dedicated to talking about the donkey? Seven of them. That's a lot of verses about the donkey. Why is that? I'm honestly not sure. They could have just said, and Jesus got his donkey, but they wanted you to hear the story. Now, here's the thing. I was trying to read about this and to figure out what was important about it and what people thought about it. But when people reflect on the particular donkey story, there's two main theories they have going on about this donkey. The first was, is that that Jesus was a really good planner. And it's not that they just went to a random stranger to grab a donkey. It's that Jesus sent word and had a donkey waiting. And the disciples went to get the donkey and it all worked out. That could have happened. Um, Another major theory of this whole thing is that it was a miracle. And Jesus, who had divine insight and, and foresight into the whole situation, predicted accurately that his disciples would find this colt unridden. They'd bring it back and he gave them directions. And so it's a miracle. And of course, that could happen. Jesus made people rise from the dead. He could obviously get himself a donkey for a parade, right? Now, here's what I think is going on. And you shouldn't trust a person when they say everyone else is wrong, but here's what I think. But I think I might be onto something here. Here's what I think is going on in the parade. You got to put yourself in the context. Jesus is very popular at this time in his ministry. It's not like only a couple of people have heard of Jesus. Most likely, all four million people in Jerusalem have heard of Jesus. I mean, he's been doing miracles. He's been raising people from the dead. He's been preaching. Many crowds at points in Scripture, we see more than 20,000 people gathered at a time to see Jesus. This man is popular. And here's the thing. If you are there on Passover and you're thinking this might be the day of Messiah, the only one who might be Messiah material right now is Jesus Christ. And they knew the prophecies that he come from the east they knew the prophecies he would come on a donkey. I think when, when the disciples show up and they find the donkey and they say, hey, we need this and the Lord needs it, I think every person there knew exactly what was going on. Because what happens right after they get the donkey? This massive parade forms around Jesus. People in the front, people in the back, because the word has spread. The Messiah is here. Now, as the parade's going on, simple question just to make sure that you're paying attention. What are the people waving? Palm branches. Does anybody know what palm branches meant to the people of Israel and to the Jewish people? Any idea? What's that? Talk louder, PJ. I love your voice. Let me hear you. Rebirth? Yes, actually, I'm going to go with that, PJ. That's perfect. See, every culture has kind of their their national identity, and they have their their symbols of importance, right? For the Jewish people, their symbol of importance was a palm branch. And specifically, waving a palm branch is how they signified freedom, or we'll say rebirth, PJ. And even 140 years earlier, the Jewish people were freed only for a couple years, and to celebrate, you know what they did? They waved palm branches. When they waved palm branches before Jesus Christ, they were proclaiming that this is the day of freedom. Now, let me just show you for the fun of it so you believe me. This is an artifact. This is an old Jewish coin. And many of their coins have palm branches, which was a symbol of their people and of the freedom they 
had. Now, let us continue. I keep losing my spot today. Are you guys staying with me? That's good. All right, we just talked about the singing. Okay, let's talk about what they were singing, and then we'll get to the end, and this is going to be a blast, because I love how this story ends. So when Jesus comes in, it was tradition in the Passover time that they would celebrate and that they would chant and and praise God. One of the things that they would chant, as we did earlier, was Hosanna. Say Hosanna. 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 Hosanna simply means, save us, we pray. Right? So it's a prayer to God, asking him to save them. And they also would say this at, at, at uh, Passover time, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which was from Psalm 118. And basically, they're saying, when the Messiah comes, the Messiah is blessed, he has the authority, he's from God. But when Jesus comes, they don't just sing about the Messiah. We see in the book of Luke that once Jesus comes down from the Mount of Olives, everybody there starts to look to Jesus now. It's not just Hosanna to God, it's Hosanna to Jesus. And they're saying, blessed is he, blessed is Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord. They're worshiping God, they're worshiping Jesus. It's a huge commotion. And if you know the story, you know that not everybody was a fan because the Pharisees showed up and they started to reprimand Jesus and the disciples and the people. They said, listen, tell these people to be quiet, Jesus. Tell them to stop talking because you are not worthy of the praise that they are giving you. And Jesus said in response, do you remember? Yes, this is the coolest part of scripture. He said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I wish they all got quiet. (laughs) Because how cool would that be? I don't know what stones sound like when they're shouting out, but I think it'd be really cool. I think what Jesus is saying, though, is this is not just a moment. I'm not just reenacting something, but this is truly a cosmic moment. This moment is so powerful that things that have no life will receive life simply to praise me. Now, if I heard that, and I was in the parade, and I, I knew the story, and I, and I knew where the Messiah was going, I'll tell you what, I'm getting amped up here. I'm getting ready to see my grandparents who've passed away. I'm getting ready to see my ancestors. I'm getting ready for a war, because that's what the Messiah would bring. And I'm just getting, oh, yes, it's time. This is the moment that we have been waiting for. So the parade comes down the mountain. They go into Jerusalem. They enter They enter the temple, and our story ends with verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. If you're talking about a letdown, that's what this story is in the way that it ends. It's the greatest letdown. It's one of the greatest disappointments. Well, it is the greatest disappointment of the day, perhaps of the year and even more. Just think about this for a second. I'll give you 10 seconds. Think about the biggest letdown you've ever had in your life. When you felt like your hopes were smashed and taken away from you. Because that's what just happened in our story. You know, there's a, there's a legend about a golfer named Arnold Palmer. I told this story a few years ago. I like this story because it gets a point across. Um, but I also don't think it's true. I think it's probably 99% not true. And so don't go back and tell people this story is true. But here's how the story, the legend of Arnold Palmer goes. Arnold was invited to play golf in Saudi Arabia by a king. The king did everything first class. He, he, he sent a, a private jet to the U.S., picked up Arnold, brought him out to Saudi Arabia. For a good week or so, Arnold Palmer played on the different courses and mingled with the princes and all the important people and had a wonderful time. And when the whole trip was over, the king was so pleased with Arnold that he just wanted to give Arnold a gift. And so he met with Arnold. He said, before you go back to America, let me ask you, is, is there anything at all that I can do for you. Legend says that Arnold simply replied, you don't have to do anything for me, king. 
you've done enough. I had a great time. Thank you for the honor of being here. But the king insisted. And so Arnold, being a collector of golf clubs, said to the king, well, how about you just send me a custom golf club from Saudi Arabia so I could add it to my collection? The king agrees. Arnold gets on the plane. He flies back to America. Now, in truth, he started to get excited for this golf club. I mean, it's from Saudi Arabia, from the great, you know, the, the princes of oil. He was thinking diamond-studded driver, something really awesome. He waited for a little while. The weeks went by, and, uh, and he was waiting for his package to come. But the package never came. Instead, one day, he got an envelope from Saudi Arabia. He thought, that's weird. I was waiting for a package, but I guess I'll open the envelope. And he opened the envelope, and he pulled, it, pulled out the piece of paper, And what he read was a title to a 500-acre golf course or golf club in America. He asked for a golf club. And the king gave him a whole golf club. 500 acres. What he thought he was going to get was going to be pretty good. What he got instead absolutely blew his mind. This is how I understand what happens at Palm Sunday. See, the Jewish people were waiting for this package to arrive, the Messiah. And they were waiting for the Messiah who would save the Jewish people from their oppression. Instead, they got a Messiah of the whole world who would save every human being who called on God, right? They just wanted to be freed from the oppression on the outside. But what they were getting was freedom from oppression on the inside. Now, let me explain the last part. This is my favorite part of the story. This blows my mind. You know, what's interesting is they prepared for the Passover feast. On the coming Friday was actually the day that they would, there were actually a handful of Passover lambs slaughtered because everyone would eat from the Passover lamb. But but on Friday, they would would slaughter the the, kind of the main Passover lamb for the the sins of Israel, which is also precisely the day that Jesus was crucified when the lamb was crucified, or the lamb wasn't crucified, it was slain. But on Palm Sunday, on this day, was the day that they chose the lamb. It was called Lamb Selection Day. So what I believe is happening is that as they're choosing the lamb to slaughter for Israel, God is choosing Jesus Christ, his son, to be the lamb who would be slain for the sins of the entire world. And in just a few days, it is true, Jesus went to the temple and didn't start a spark. But you see, the moment Jesus went to that cross and he spread his blood on the cross, he began a new type of revolution that no one expected. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, the the most amazing thing happened is that in the temple, there was a great curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And that curtain, the moment Jesus was crucified, was ripped in two. Why? Because the divine presence of God was was allowed to go free. And because of the blood of Jesus and the covering of our sins, whoever believes in Jesus would be filled with the divine presence of God. We call him the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would come to make a revolution inside of all people who would believe in Jesus Christ. That's why I love Palm Sunday. It's amazing. And so what can you do here with this story? Two things. If you already know Jesus, I have something for you. If you don't know Jesus yet, I have something for you. If you already know Jesus, I, I, I was sitting yesterday. We had, it was soccer Saturday. Our kids play soccer. We had three games. It was a bad Saturday. We lost all of our games, which is slightly depressing. But, um, but one game, I was really frustrated. I dropped my water bottle because I was just like, what is going on here? And, and we were playing this one team that I just felt like they're playing so dirty and they're cheating and they're being so bad. And it's, I, I was just starting to blame this other team for being really bad competitors, right? Now, I wasn't coaching this game, but if I was coaching that game, that would be really bad coaching. 
Because one of the things a good coach does, you don't focus on what the other team is doing. You focus on how you can be growing and getting better from that game. You see, the reality is, like I did yesterday, there is always a temptation that when we hit hard circumstances that we don't understand, when we go through pain and suffering, when people have wronged us, when money's tight, our natural tendency is just to look out and blame all the factors around us. But see, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus doesn't want to just fix your situations around you. He wants to grow you deeper in here. You know? You thought that you were going to get a golf club and you got a full golf club. God wants to do something so much bigger inside of you. So keep that in mind this week. Maybe God has a surprise waiting for you. Maybe there's been something God's been trying to teach you for a while, but you've been too busy blaming everyone else around you. And God is now saying, I want you to step back and I want you to learn how I want you to grow from this situation. And the last but not least, if you're here this morning and you have never cried out to God for his salvation, God is faithful. And all who cry out to him and ask to be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ will be saved. So I'm going to pray in just a moment if you want to pray along with me and give your life to Jesus, we'd invite you to do that. But before I pray, I want to just read to you the final psalm. This is from Psalm 118. This is the same psalm where he cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I just love this testimony. Here it is. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live. And we'll proclaim what the Lord has done. Let us pray. God, we praise you that you are God. You are creator, sustainer, and you are the rescuer, God. We thank you that as you saw the problem of sin and suffering, and you saw our brokenness in this world, Jesus, you never gave up on us but rather you became like us and you gave your life so that we could be forgiven and freed from the sins that separate us from you. If you're here this morning and you have not put your trust in Jesus, I invite you to do that. It's very simple. Just admit that you are a sinner in need of the grace of Jesus Christ. Cry out to him. Believe that he is your Lord and Savior and choose to follow him. And if you give your life to Jesus, he will never leave you or forsake you, and he will fill you with his power and with his Holy Spirit. And that's you this morning. Make sure you find me after the service so we can pray and talk, and we can help you grow as a believer. Now, Lord, we love you. We thank you. God, help us to go. Help us to go and praise this morning, for you are the Messiah, not just of a small group of people but the Messiah of the whole world and faithful to all who call on you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.